all this is dr mubeen sayed for drbeen.com sorry that i am a couple of minutes late apologies for that let's start our discussion we will continue with our um open forum from yesterday today there are a bunch of very important topics that i would like to cover so hopefully you're all doing good let's start i'm going to share my screen so first let me see if i can show you a cartoon <laughs> so this is actually not my idea uh the the punch line i took it from an urdu cartoon maybe they took it from somewhere else but what is happening in here is go ahead read it see if it makes sense so the the doctor is saying we don't have b12 injections so we will give you two b6 and the patient is responding saying good thing you found b6 otherwise i would need 12 b1s so with this let's start our discussion um let's look at the so this is drbeen.com this is the twitter thread we'll continue from where we left off yesterday and uh, for the twitter thread please know that when i like a post that is when i'm i'm going through the posts to make sure that i am prepared to answer them and so as i continue to look at the posts i like them and the ones that are not liked yet doesn't mean that they have any problem with that it's just that i have i feel that i cannot cover them all within today's time so i will then take them off later so this <laughs> actually uh, is my own way of knowing how far i had covered so please don't mind if i have not liked them yet so as i cover the remaining part later on i would hit like on them as well so <laughs> that is just my way to track it all right so back here um so we had covered this discussion yesterday uh starting from here tony karalika says why isn't metabolic mitochondrial health larger focus with long haulers so uh Tony I saw the the diagram here which is talking about the uh, 5-hydroxy tryptamine and the uh, tryptophan oxidant so what I'll do is this I have to do two things that I've taken many notes fluvoxamine um, voxamine was supposed to be today but we are continuing with the uh, open forum I will take up this one next week as well and we'll talk about it I think if we are comfortable with the vaccine related discussions and we can take a few days break i can then move on purely towards long haulers and then come back to vaccines later on here we have janet janet is saying i already take 25 mg of fluvoxamine a day for ocd will that give me any protection and then uh, somebody is asking that hey how is it for um Uh, ocd and here we have fluvoxamine couple of things here and again i may be wrong in in doing this dr drew has reported separately to me that fluvoxamine has been very good for his uh, headaches and um fatigue like feeling a uh, uh, situation after the covid-19 so he said it really works very well so there is something there and there have been other reports as well so this is a study here uh, so janet look at this study fluvoxamine versus placebo and clinical deterioration in outpatients with symptomatic covid-19 so if i can very quickly um and joe says i can confirm that joe are you talking about fluvoxamine as well so if i can very quickly just rough idea of how fluvoxamine works in the brain so here is we have let's say a neuron end of the neuron so if i make a complete neuron over here let's say this is a neuronal body and then there is an axon axon is the is the thread through which the nerve impulses goes out and then at the end of the thread there is a knob like structure 
which is where the neurotransmitter are released. And then here is the uh, nucleus. And these are dendrites. Dendrites are the ones through which the, the neuron receives impulses. Impulses arrive in the neuron through the dendrites. So on the dendrites, other neurons and their exons come and synapse or they end there. So let's say this is a this kind of a, a, a exon terminating here and this is another neuron here. So the these are the dendrites. So this is the cell body. Then these are the dendrites. This is the exon. So imagine this end part of the exon is what actually releases the neurotransmitters. So I have made that over here. This is that. And then, of course, it would synapse. Synapse me will mean it would end on some other neuron or some other effector. This may be a muscle, for example. This may be a gland. This may be a, a another neuron. So in case of the nervous tissue, this is another neuron, which is starting here, and it would then continue on. So here, 5-hydroxytryptamine, or serotonin, is released. When the serotonin is released, we're talking about the brain now, it goes and it acts on its receptors and that then does a specific function. Then what happens is this 5-hydroxytryptamine five, five or serotonin, a lot of it is actually re-uptaken, meaning is it, it is taken back up by the neuron that released it and then it is stored again to be released later on. That is like if you go out to play ball, you bring a ball with you, you go and play it, and then you bring the ball back with you. That is what happens. Imagine the serotonin is the ball. It is the 5-hydroxytryptamine is the chemical substance that is a ball that is released by neuron A to neuron B. When that ball, that chemical substance has activated the neuron B, then we take that ball back and store it again in A to be sent out again later on. The um, many of the um, see or mood related issues, for example, depression or anxiety or OCD, one of the chemical issue that is seen is that the serotonin levels are less in these folks. So to increase the serotonin level, what we do is we block the reuptake of serotonin. And so when it is not reuptaken, then it stays in the synapse for longer period of time. It stays with its receptor and continues to activate the receptor for a longer period of time. And so that is how the function is enhanced. The um, fi uh, fluvoxamine is one such substance that blocks the reuptake or reduces the reuptake of serotonin. And that is what causes mood change or, or, or balancing in the mood. Same drug is helping COVID patients who have nervous system um, symptoms. So uh, this is that study here. So what they said was, in this randomized trial that included 152 adult outpatients, and we had talked about it in the past as well. That is why it is already highlighted. So what they said was they had clinical symptoms for seven days. They were look, they were having clinical clinical deterioration occurred in zero patients who were receiving fluvoxamine versus six patients who were not receiving fluvoxamine. So the point they are making is that yes, fluvoxamine is protective, at least for symptoms. Is it protective against the virus itself or not? We do not know. But does it help reduce the symptoms, especially the neurological symptoms? Yes. So that is the uh, study here. So uh, Janet, to your question, yes, it is at least symptomatically it is protective. Continuing on, how, how are things on the life side? John Snyder is saying that Oh, so that France. So the comments scroll. So by the time I click something, the other comment, smart. Um, John Snyder was saying here, well, Burton is another. Yeah. 
uh, Nina says, Dr. Bean, show everyone your, char your character, the one that you had sent over. Let me see. Uh, I thought I had downloaded it. Here it is. So let me show it. So uh, where is the here? OK, guys, so check this out. This is Nina's cousin who made Ivermectin Man. And it looks like me, actually. So maybe at some level, I am the Ivermectin Man as well. So Nina, thank you. And thanks to your cousin for doing this. Maybe we should have this on the shirt. OK, so uh, continuing back here. So then is. James 520 saying any thoughts on this news. So this news over here, I have it open here. This news says, and sorry for this, when I, I have an ad blocker, and so some of the sites do not like it, fairly so. So Israeli hospital claims they may have found cure for COVID-19. So here there is a doctor, his name is Professor Nadir Arbor, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, he has he's in the Integrated Cancer Prevention Center, and they have developed a uh, therapy called ExoCD24, and they are saying it is inexpensive, and they are saying that it has shown out of 30 patients they managed with this drug, 29 recovered, and I think for one the recovery was just a little bit delayed. The uh, the question here in the on the Twitter was that what is this drug? What is the mechanism of action? And what they're saying here is just this much. The drug was developed by Professor Dror Mevorak, Director of Research Center of Rheumatology and Internal Medicine, to deal with overactive immune system that causes secretion of cytokines. Now, this could be something similar to, for example, let's say steroids. This could be something similar to linolimab. This could be something like uh, ivermectin. This could be something like hydroxychloroquine. So they do not tell us exactly what is the mechanism of action of the drug. So because of that, I cannot really say how it works. But their claim is that it works. So interesting article. I think uh, as we learn more, we'll figure it out. Um, Mary Martin says, uh, actually, Phil Lee says, seems very much like ivermectin. It is possible that it is something to do or something like ivermectin. Phil Lee says, I am late, no worries. Gary Bennett says, Dr. Mubin, you know the vaccines have material from aborted, murdered babies, yet you think it's fine to get these experimental injections. Doesn't this bother you at all? Um, I have uh, discussed this many times. And the um, many times I've discussed this uh, question. If you would ask my opinion, I'll give you that as well. So let's talk about it. I always say that my favorite vaccine is Novavax. Novavax is not built in the cells that are from copies or clones of aborted fetal tissue. That's one. Then the second uh, vaccine that I like uh, myself is Moderna's vaccine. Moderna's vaccine has messenger RNA that is in a lipid nanoparticle, and it is also not built in any of the fetal uh, tissue clones. Then are the vaccines like AstraZeneca, and then there are other vaccines as well that are built in the fetal tissue clone cells. And I have done this discussion so, so many times that um, Number one, if you ask my opinion, I am OK with those cells used to build the vaccine. These uh, children who were aborted, they um, this is a blessing that they their tissue is used for some humane purposes. Why were they aborted? Was that the right decision or not? That is a different uh, situation that I think everybody has a different belief there. But this is, to me, it's very similar to some, it's a very delicate matter, so I'm kind of being very careful right now. To me, it is 
when people donate their organs. And when I have said that in the past, people have commented back to me saying, these children did not um, agree to donate their organs. So uh, then I have gone into the uh, Catholic churches uh, uh, messaging and how they have said that if other vaccines are not available, then you can use this and so on. So my message is very simple. If you do not feel comfortable with it, by all means, please don't take it. In my discussions, I always discuss this, that which vaccine is built in what way. So you are aware that this vaccine is using the copies of the fetal tissue cells. This vaccine is using, for example, animal tissue. This vaccine is using bacteria to be developed. There is a vaccine, somebody sent me the link today. This, this is coming from Canada, where the vaccine is built with plant tissue cells instead of any of the animals. And then there are vaccines that do not use any of the cells. So that is what my position is. Um, I would prefer, and I have said this many times as well, I would prefer that now all of us who are upset about the vaccines that are built in the fetal tissue, that we focus our energy to use the latest technology that can take a healthy person's, adult person's cell and can convert that to a stem cell. The stem cell's benefit is that it can continue to replicate and divide in many different ways. So because that technology has become available, this is the time that fetal tissue cell usage can be stopped and alternative cells can be used. So my request to Gary, you and to others will be to, to ask your um, congressmen, senators, uh, pharmaceutical companies to say, start switching away from the fetal tissue cell copies towards more adult based stem cells. So that is the that is what I can offer. And uh, again, it's not something that I can argue too much. It is your belief. You decide what is best for you and what you how you think it. There is a choice of vaccines available. All of my discussions have that choice or where does did the vaccine come from with it? Okay, so continuing, <laughs> Siddhartha says, Ivermectin woman, we should make an Ivermectin woman as well. Uh, <clears throat> Mary Mart Martin says, yeah, love the drawing, yes to, to shirt. So this uh, drawing that Nina did, uh, Nina's cousin did, should we have that? Nina, we can have that if I get the approval from your cousin to use it, because of course this is his copyrighted material. Um, all right, so continuing. Jenna Taylor, Taylor says, I love Ivermectin man. Um, Gold Country Russ says, question, wife has shortness of breath at day 15, but blood oxy never below 97. How can that happen? Our oximeter has been tested and is accurate. One way to do that is to test someone else at the same time. So for example, use the same oximeter and let's say you do not have the shortness of breath, you test it and then simultaneously just at the same time, then give it to her and have her test it. And so you would know if the meter is working correctly or not. That is one way. Another way is to just get one more meter and test it as well. Uh, that is another way. And then thirdly, shortness of breath can be symptomatic as well. Sometimes we become anxious and we feel that we are short in breath while we are actually not short in breath. So there can be multiple reasons. Sometimes our muscles are not working correctly and we are fatigued and we have to do labor to breathe. And we feel we are short in breath, but oxygen levels are fine. It is just that the moving of the muscles is difficult. So shortness of breath does not always mean low oxygen level. With COVID, many times it actually means that, but it's not always that way. And, and Jim, that is what I understand. So Jim says not all Christians agree with Catholic Church or the Pope. I, for one, don't agree with the Pope at all. So, and I understand it, that there are, uh, within Christianity, there are various branches that agree or do not agree. And that is why, uh, Jim, you have been with me for a long time. I have never um, tried to say it is okay or it is not okay. I've always said that different vaccines have different uh, possibilities. And um, 
you can decide how you would like to. <laughs> Samina Chaudhary says we want Evermectin woman. OK, so uh, maybe um, uh, we should request for an Ivermectin woman uh, character as well from Nina's cousin. Nina, maybe we can pay them for their work and we can have two characters. OK, so uh, continuing on. This is a very good question. Uh, Burj Ghazarian says, Avipradil, anything new? Avipradil has been working. I haven't looked at its latest, but it has been working successfully. It has been used in India as well. Um, so I am ignoring Twitter once more. Robert Tul Tulp says, would a third and fourth, fifth, etc., vaccine shot improve the efficacy? So the, the way efficacy is measured is to see that will the immune system become prepared enough that when the actual virus or the challenge arrives, it would attack it to eliminate it without attacking so much that it kind of destroys the body with, it, with that process as well. So the dose and the frequency has to be um, kept in a way that it does not cause overreaction and it also does not cause underreaction. So these two doses are actually built in a way that these can be creating sufficient reaction. Now, with the variant variants that are coming in, it may be necessary to have boosters that target the mutated parts of the variants as well. Otherwise, one or two doses are sufficient. So TCS says, Dr. Bean drawing preferred. My drawing is that <laughs> that little ch chunky looking uh, ivermectin man, whichever you say. So Nancy Camp says, I read today that those who have had COVID should get only one shot of vaccine comments. So I have talked about this, Nancy, in the past as well. Look, think about it for a second with me. If somebody had COVID and had recovered, do they really need a vaccine? Their body had actually experienced the virus, had a fight with it, and took care of it. So they actually don't need a vaccine. And then the question of one dose or two doses also does not matter. So for example, if I had the infection and then I decide to have the vaccine, then I take one dose or two doses, doesn't matter. My body is kind of already ready. For my body, the vaccine is just going to act like another set of infection that happened and it's a very tiny dose the body is just not even going to be bothered it's just going to eliminate it right within 24 hours and say whatever now the question for vaccination becomes interesting when between the infection till the time of vaccination for example let's say somebody became sick in january of 2020 and now they are, they have the vaccine available and between these two points their own immune system changed. For example, they became immunosuppressed or they were made immunosuppressed by drugs or they had an organ transplant and then made immunosuppressed or they had some bone marrow issues that caused their memory cells and other immune cells to become, you know, um, wasted or, or suppressed or they, they are diabetic and their diabetes is not controlled. That means their immune system would not function correctly or they are on steroids and it is possible that their immune system is suppressed. So there can be many reasons that a person from point A to point B in time may become immunosuppressed or immune system may change. That is one possibility where vaccine taking vaccine may be important. Another possibility is that the virus itself has changed. For example, we have variants. So somebody who had the vaccine or the infection in January of last year, and now 12 months later, let's say there is there are variants that are drastically different, which is not the case yet. But let's say there are variants that are drastically different. Then taking a vaccine with the new variant will be interesting as well. And then finally, once again, if you still feel that you want to have the vaccine, one dose or two dose will not matter. Good question. 
Uh, Sipple Steve says, have you heard about the use of an anti-cancer drug, Bivacizumab, to treat COVID? Just curious. No. So uh, I'm going to take a note here. So I will look that up. For example, today I was talking about vaccines. Today somebody said the Medicago vaccine from Canada, and that uses plants. OK. Um, how is everyone doing here? Let's answer a couple of more questions here with the with, <laughs> uh, with the Twitter as well, so we can plow through that too. Uh, here is another question. Cynthia Armstrong says, my husband, 72, healthy, and I, 67, diabetic, metformin. My husband got vaccine, mRNA, disturbs me. I refused. I am on ivermectin twice monthly. Am I wrong? Um, so the I have been always saying that becoming specific to a person is always a difficult thing for me. And actually, medically, it is unethical for me to provide advice to one person. I can talk in generalities or hypo hypothetically, or I can talk about the concepts. But treating someone or giving them advice like this for a specific reason is difficult. So the um, if I am in a situation where I am diabetic, I am 67, and I am afraid of the vaccine, then fine, that is my choice. The consequences are mine as well. Now, what are the consequences? For example, let's say if I'm taking ivermectin twice monthly. This is something that has been newly used, ivermectin twice monthly or once a weekly. What are the side effects of ivermectin? Use it that way, we do not know yet. But let's say there are not much side effects. That means I will have to just continue to take that for a long time and then hope that the pandemic and other people are vaccinated and the pandemic starts ramping down. Let's say in three, four months that happens, I've been taking ivermectin during that time. Lucky me. Now, if there are side effects of the ivermectin, for example, blood thinning or other such effects with the um, blood brain barrier, then I would have an issue. Taking vaccine, I'm talking about myself. I feel comfortable with vaccines. So taking vaccine for myself, if I were given ivermectin and vaccine, I will take vaccine, so I am done. I am not going to take any further ivermectins. I'm not going to take any other things. I just have the vaccine. I know I'm protected now. And even with vaccine, it's not necessary that we are 100% protected, but there is a chance that I'm protected. So I would always prefer vaccine. So. Uh, for me to comment that are you wrong or not is not possible. Uh, you're taking ivermectin, congratulations that you at least have access to ivermectin, um, but the decision for vaccination is yours. Uh, tw Twitter, Twitter for Truth says, Cynthia, I'm nervously about to begin ivermectin prophylaxis. How long have you been on it? So they're asking, I'm too, I too am holding off on messenger RNA vaccines. That's fine. So the, there's a discussion there. Then uh, Stang352, post-COVID infection two months ago, and now smelling cigarette smoke randomly. No smokers here. Would this be related to COVID? Had lost smell for about three weeks, then returned to normal in between. So yes. So Stang, what happens is um, just like phantom limbs, Phantom limb is a situation where someone loses a limb, for example, in an accident or a soldier in war, but their nerves that are at the root of the limb are still connected to their brain area. We call it homunculus in the brain. Homunculus is the representation of the body's picture in the brain. So what happens is, if I go to the drawing board for a second, it's a fascinating area. I love um, the nervous system very much. So let's say this is our brain. In the brain, we have the representation of the whole body. And so normally, if I slice the brain like this, then brain would look something like this in that slice. 
and the uh, for example the lips are they and nose have a very large representation for sensory areas then eyes then um, very large representation for hand and in the hand especially the thumb then uh, large rep representation for genitalia then tiny representation for arm and then body's trunk and then foot and the leg this is the representation of the body in our brain big areas are those that are sensory areas for example our nose are very sensitive and that is coming from the old time our lips are very sensitive that is why we kiss and we feel great about it because they are very sensitive and we use this for that sense genitalia are very sensitive and then hands are very sensitive and in the hand thumb especially the thumb is supposed to be 50 percent of the hand now what happens is the nerves for example let's say lips we use lips for a second let's say here are the actual lips of the person here are the lips now the nerves from the lips they go in and they uh, they connect to the lips area so when the lip is touched the appropriate area is stimulated and we feel our brain makes us feel a touch in the area of the lip now if if you cut this nerve but still go and stimulate the area in the lip by some electrical probe you would still feel the sensation on the lip this is called law of projection our brain can project the sensation to the right area of our body phantom limb is a possibility where i don't have an arm or hand anymore but i still feel pain in my hand or i still feel that my hand is clenched and i cannot open it because there is no control on it so you may have seen that then these patients are treated by putting a mirror in front of their other hand and they're asked to look in the mirror the other hand and open it and their brain would process that as this hand which is missing has become opened that is the same process here for the phantom smell this is a covid outcome where when the smell goes away the the um, nerves in the olfactory bulb so let's say this is the olfactory bulb in the roof of the nose this is the olfactory bulb and olfactory nerve and bulb and then we know that when the covid occurs what happens is that the epithelial areas in the olfactory area they become uh, congested and they become inflamed and there is extra inflammation there because of the infection of this area then it takes some time for this infection to resolve but what happens is just like long hauling symptoms it is possible that some time this inflammation just stays there a tiny bit maybe the virus sticks there for some more time or just the inflammation stays there for some more time for other reasons and now what happens is every time there is some inflammation that occurs there is slight irritation of the sensory nerve which gives you phantom smell and that phantom smell can be anything in for example in your case you're saying you feel there is smoke in other cases people uh, feel different kind of smells so these are called phantom smells these are related to covid they also go away if i have a patient who is in this state i usually would advise them to ask the doctor to talk about steroids or take ivermectin for some time and that hypothetically can help so good question um linda m says are mortality figures in india so low because of ivermectin if there are effective treatments why do we need vaccines so i just talked about it uh, and it is possible that it is uh, the figures are low in india because of ivermectin i think india stayed ahead of the world uh, in the beginning they started using hydroxychloroquine uh, with zinc then they started using ivermectin successfully so they have been staying ahead of the game for compared to the rest of the world so it may be ivermectin it may be just generally they're using a lot of therapies now again what do we need vaccine or not i just discussed that a few minutes ago um 
if you are not comfortable with vaccine, then taking something like ivermectin may be useful. And if you are comfortable with vaccine, then taking vaccine is also important. So I'm going to look at some of the <laughs> live site here. Uh, Buta fan says, <laughs> uh, is it a bioweapon? So Buta fan, this, uh, define for me what is a bioweapon. Many people have been asking me, is it a bioweapon? I need the definition of bioweapon for what do they mean? What What is a bioweapon? Um, a simple garden says, I'm 61, Catherine Dele, and so I think that is a separate discussion. Barbara Warren says, what Dr. Bean makes sense now? I heard a little of that when healing from COVID-19 and loss of taste are odd times for a month or two. Yes, and interestingly, the uh, Barbara, the, the smell, uh, sorry, the taste nerves are not affected, but we have something called taste and smell and flavor. Flavor is actually food's taste plus smell together is called flavor. That is why you can give somebody the apple, you can have them smell apple and ask them to eat a potato and they would think they're eating apple. The reason is that potato has a similar texture like an apple. And if you give them the smell of the apple, then the flavor of the potato would feel like apple. So the uh, same thing is true for taste abnormality. COVID actually does not do anything to the nerves, taste nerves, but when the olfactory nerve, the smell nerve doesn't work correctly, then taste feels incorrect because flavor is gone. And so that is what we call it a bad taste. Uh, Denise says, Dr. Bean, could you make a video about Ebola virus? Uh, sure, yes. Let me, I think we should, we, what we should do is this. We should have a survey where Ebola, where we should vote on what are the top topics to talk about and then we should decide. <laughs> Doug says, it is really a bad bioweapon if it is one <laughs> if possible, yes. Um, germ warfare, germ warfare, that make a very germ warfare. For example, I don't believe in it, what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to as a fantasy or fiction. Yes, you can say one country decided to cause a global panic and issue and they created some sort of a germ and spread it out possible. But um, yeah, so germ warfare are possible. I think these are really bad things to do if um, if that is the case. Simple Garden says, my sense of smell has completely changed and consequently so has my taste. I no longer have a taste for many of the things I used to. Of course, I just explained it, that the taste is actually what you are missing is flavor. And the flavor is a combination of taste and it's the combination of the sensation coming from the taste nerve and the olfactory nerve together is called flavor. When the olfactory nerve start, starts going bad and temporarily, then the flavor would go away as well or become bad. <laughs> Phil Lee says, can you cure my me of my sweet tooth? Uh, I wish I could do that because if I could do that, I'll do that for my wife as well. She has a <laughs> sweet tooth which cannot be stopped. Okay, so looking some more on the Twitter side. How many more hours before Liron Lamab is unleashed? So I have a discussion here of Liron Lamab, um, a drug that has been out there for some time. This is their uh, press release where they are talking about a bunch of things. And one of those is the Lironlimab and COVID. So I have that uh, document open here as well. This is November 2020. Lironlimab has been working with a doctor. His name is here, Nicholas Agresti. And he is from Southeast Georgia Health System, Brunswick, Georgia, US. He, Dr. Uh, Agresti 
has created a case series of, I think, six patients where they used lirolimab and they have shown good results. I, what I really fail to understand is why are they not getting traction? Is it political? Is it uh, an issue with the cytodyne team? Is it FDA not listening? Things like BAM Lev Levy Lenivimab has become approved after 100 people's. They say it is 400, but really it is 100. Three, there were three cohorts with 100 each with different doses, and one was placebo. So it is really 100. And they got approved. Why are lirolimab not getting approved? I cannot understand. But from a mechanistic point of view, lirolimab does show its effect. So here is this. Uh, and I have the link to this uh, study in the description as well if you wanted to go over various cases and see how those cases progressed and how it only map helped. So to, to answer your question, Bart, how many more hours before it only map? Don't know. They, from my point of view, they seem ready, but somehow they don't have that traction. Um, Huang Yan Ling says, any news on the research into MECFS and long COVID or treatment options? Why do doctors have absolutely no clue what these conditions are? And we is, and we are here reluctant to refer their patients to specialists, and specialists are reluctant to run tests on us. So, uh, Huang, this is a problem in general at this time. Um, one, doctors are not reading up, and secondly. Even if they are reading up, they're not connecting the dots, how to figure out what is going on. I appreciate Dr. Yo and Dr. Patterson that they have been working on what should be the labs that will be useful to see what is going on. So I would request you again, I have no affiliation with them other than they appear sometimes with me as guests. I have no um, financial affiliation or association with them, nothing. There is no such um, thing, but I believe they have some labs that they are now running on the patients who are long haulers. My question to the long haulers here, you've been hearing about Dr. Patterson and Dr. Yo. Has any one of you gone to them and gotten your lab work done and seen if there is any um, outcome? So I'll continue going, but I'll look here to the comments as well. If somebody had the labs done from Dr. Patterson and, and uh, Dr. Yo. So Huang, this is a this is a sad, sad thing. What I was thinking, and I think I should just um, hold myself to it and just next week only talk about long haulers. What I was thinking was to talk about long haulers to see, at least to provide some guidance to say, get following kind of tests done, get following things ruled in and out to understand what is going on. Susan McLister says, can you address the nursing home deaths post vaccine? Thank you. So Susan, a couple of things. Number one, I had done a talk about 23 deaths in Norway. And then I have a very interesting article open here. Um, this is by DW. And I thought it was really comprehensive. What they had done was they talked about COVID-19 vaccine causing deaths. And what they did was they went over every single country's reporting of deaths. For example, they're saying as of this publication's date, at least 37 million coronavirus vaccinations have been administered in the countries that have reported deaths, including USA. And then uh, in those countries, the total number of reported deaths are 250. That includes USA. And in the US, there are 181 deaths reported on through the, uh, the adverse reaction reporting mechanism. Then what they did was they went over one country at one time, for example, Germany, and the deaths. And then they have said that here are the number of deaths that happened in Germany. And here is what they did after their um, investigation and came out and said, uh, is it related to vaccine or not? And guess what? The, in all cases, the answer has been, no, it is not vaccine. And to which um, at least I believe one case that you know, F uh, Florida's doctor, I strongly believe that that was not 
not related to vaccine. I think that was related to vaccine. And if that was relate, related to vaccine, it is possible that there are others that are related to vaccine. One. Second, as much as, for example, in Norway's case, they said 23 deaths or, or whatever that number, 23 or 29, 29 deaths. And that was because people were too old. And when they were given the vaccine, that caused adverse reaction, for example, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And their body's condition was not such that they could take diarrhea or, or vomiting. And because of their pre-existing illness, their fragility, they passed away. To me, that still feels like a problem with the vaccine. That vaccine triggered symptoms which tip, tip them over. This is a gap in the trial as well. That this should have been a message coming out of trial that those patients who cannot handle the side effects of the vaccine, for example, diarrhea, there are patients who, who are so fragile that their blood pressures are so low, their heart is so weak, that if you just reduce their blood pressure a little bit more by, let's say, causing diarrhea or vomiting, they cannot, the body cannot sustain it and cannot bring it back. And so in such cases, vaccine should not have been given. And now the, the discussion should have been with the family members that, hey, if we give vaccine, there is a chance that they may not be able to take the, uh, the side effects. And if we don't give vaccine, there is a chance that they would get the infection. And uh, many of, at least in these cases, there were some patients who were already terminally ill. So this is a very difficult decision making to do. And uh, somebody had made a comment, actually, a lot of folks made a comment under that Norway video saying, uh, I think a little bit cynicism that, well, the vaccine was supposed to save the older people. And now the vaccine is killing the older people. Uh, that's not the case that it is killing every old person. It is a very specific body state, which the fragility, which is in very old, who are very sick as well and are already in hospice-like situation, and then they are tipped over as well by the vaccine. And doctors should have been careful. The vaccine folks should have given these kind of messages as well. In Norway, they gave that message afterwards, and they said, well, stop. Now do not administer vaccine to anyone who is in a fragile state. So here in this one, they went over uh, Germany, they, then they went over Spain, at least seven died, and they talked about what was, I went over the whole article, and then they talked about what was the reason, then US and the number of deaths here, and then what are the reasons, and the VAERS system or Vaccine Adverse Reaction Reporting System, the reporting in there, and then the investigations there, then Norway, 30 people, and that situation, Belgium situation, Peru situation. So I really loved this uh, article, at least from this point of view, that they had put all of that data together in one place and given the official responses. Now, official responses we could disagree with and say that, hey, guys, you are just lying to us. And in some cases, I feel that they are, for example, when Norway, in Norway, they say it's unrelated. It is coincidental, meaning they were already very fragile and you gave the vaccine and this just happened. They were going to die anyways. And they said it is coincidental. I think that it is vaccine that tipped them over. So that that is the case. That means doctors will have to be careful to see if a person can take the vaccine or not. This is similar thing to allergic reactions. People who have severe allergies should not get vaccine. It is the same thing here as well. So good question, Susan. Jim Walker says, question, could anti auto antibodies? This is a beautiful question. And um, I'm going to explain some mechanism here. So before I go there and talk about auto antibodies, I want to look at what is happening on the live side. So how are things here? Interestingly, on the live side, we have comments from YouTube and from um, 
some from Periscope, but not from Facebook. I don't know if you are connected with Facebook or not. Um, you are live. OK. So let's see. Before I go to autoantibodies, because that is a, an important topic, uh, let's see the questions. Um, here, the DSE. I received Moderna the other day in my left arm. I have some slight arm pain. Should I request a second dose in my right arm to spread the pain, or is the efficiency different that way? No. So totally up to you. If you felt that, hey, I don't want to have more pain in the left arm, now give me on the right, that is fine. It would not cause any change in efficacy. Because the cells are going to pick up the vaccine and run around in the whole body and give it to the lymph nodes. So it is not like that woman, uh, what is her name? Dolores Cahill, that every cell would start expressing spike proteins. No, the, the cells would run around and the immune cells and bring them to the lymph nodes to T cell and B cell and present it to them. So you get it here or here, the cells are going to use, uh, take those up and go to the lymph nodes. Samina says, please make a video on pregnancy and COVID-19 in MTCT in treatment of COVID in pregnancy. I had done one discussion about the pregnancy. I can do one more. Maybe there is some uh, more information. So let's say pregnancy and COVID. Okay, took the note. TD says, question, we retire to Thailand in four months. My wife can get Corona back there, but should we wait for Moderna in USA? That is totally up to you. The vaccines are going to have similar effects. So if you can wait, I like Moderna. <laughs> so that, that's just my personal bias. I like Moderna. So if you can wait and get Moderna, that would be great. But um, if you think that you can, how would you travel without a vaccine? I am not comfortable traveling without vaccinations. <laughs> Diversity love. I am working out now. Aerial silk tap dancing and katak, so I can get the vaccine. <laughs> Very good. Did I have to dance as well before the vaccine? Uh, Remembrance of Almighty question. Someone feeling severely anxious, could it be from post-COVID? Yes, it can be post-COVID. It can be due to COVID. It can be even pre-COVID, just the anxiety of the vaccine, anxiety of the disease itself. But yes, post-COVID people have been known to be depressed because of the um, lymphatic issues, lymphatic flow issues. So Sunshine Beam says, what about Sinopharm? So I had actually promised, I think today, Sinopharm is the promise I had made, not the fluvoxamine. And here we are. So I still have to do look up the data to talk about it. So Sinopharm is in my notes. I'm going to write it down once more, uh, talk about it. Wayne says, ivermectin trial. There was a marked reduction of self-reported anosmia, hyposmia, hyposmia, a reduction of cough and tendency to lower viral load and lower IgG titers, which warrant assessment in larger trials, Lancet. And yes, that, that is absolutely correct. Um, Nancy says, is Johnson & Johnson vaccine safer than Moderna and Pfizer? The good thing about Johnson & Johnson is it is one shot. The bad thing, you see the initial discussion of, of virus, uh, the fetal tissue or not tissue, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is built in cells that are called P PERC6, PER.C6 cells. They are retinal cells from an aborted fetus. So some people may not like that, um, that part of the vaccine. Otherwise, it is one dose vaccine and its efficacy continues to build up as the time passes. So I love Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well from its mechanisms point of view. Sunshine Beam says here in UAE, they are giving only Sinopharm. OK, I'll do some research on this. I mean, if they are only giving Sinopharm, then what else can you do? Um, 
<laughs> RT says no question from Facebook because Zuckerberg can't handle the truth. They have actually taken down my videos on Periscope as well. So if you go to my live Periscope, which is happening right now, if you look at it afterwards, it just says this broadcast is not available. So they just removed my video. Simple Garden says, how do you feel about the half dose vaccine suggested for 18 to 55 year old? So remember in case of AstraZeneca, they had said that half dose and full dose has, has been more effective than full dose and full dose. So that is interesting. They still have not been able to tell us what is the mechanism for that. Uh, but then half dose only, Simple Garden, can you tell me uh, what is the uh, link to that? I wanna see the mechanism. Because the reason is when these companies do trial, they try various doses and then they come back and report which dose did what. So I cannot guess that how would a dose work. I would have to look at the data to see dose was given, what happened with the dose, and then kind of think about it. Margaret was here earlier. Um, I hope Margaret, Margaret is OK. Um, John Daniel says, is it possible not to have antibodies after taking vaccines, especially when we didn't have any side effects after vaccines, vaccination? So uh, we have done this uh, discussion before as well. Just like some people who get actual infection, they go T helper one pathway predominantly than T helper two. That means they make less antibodies and they make more cytotoxic response. It is possible that the same behavior can occur in some people with the vaccines as well. So that means you may not have the right quantities of vaccines developed, but ideally, if your immune system is fine, if you're a healthy person, then ideally your body has learned to tackle the, the pathogen, if not through the antibodies, then through the cytotoxic T cells. Um, Sunshine Beam says, can rheumatoid patients get the vaccine? Yes, so there is no issue with that. Rheumatoid patients have an autoimmune disorder, but that is a an autoimmune disorder that will not get aggravated by the vaccine. <laughs> One more question here, and then I'm going to go back to Westfield. I just answered... Uh, so player unknown, which vaccine women should take who is planning to conceive in coming year? So I was reading on the CDC site and they said any of the vaccines. So and let's just think about it for a second. <clears throat> All vaccines that we're talking about, they will produce memory B cells and memory T cells that would just go to sleep till the virus arrives and then they would attack it. Now, it has nothing to do with your... Uh, conception. So any vaccine will work fine. Westfield says, uh, Sunshine, Sunshine, did I answer your question? Okay, so <clears throat> there is a question from Facebook. We were looking for something from Facebook. So Romana Belkova Graham says, Dr. Mabin, I just noticed an interesting comment in this thread. Is there actually any study besides anecdotal evidence for vaccines reactivating dormant herpes family viruses long-term in patients? No, there is no study. Um, there has been, and this can happen with any disease, that sometimes when we become sick, our immune system goes down. That allows opportunistic viruses and bacteria or fungi or the bad thing sitting in our body to become activated or, or get a ch chance to spring up. This can happen in any condition where we are weak. For example, uncontrolled diabetes. For example, uh, immunosuppression. For example, taking steroids, for example, bone marrow issues. 
So for example, nutritional issues, for example, liver issues. So anything that can cause our nutritional status to go down can cause these uh, opportunistic pathogens to spring up. So it is possible to get, for example, COVID and other infections also pop up. And um, I don't expect the vaccine to make somebody so sick that other uh, uh, infections will pop up. You're welcome. Um, a Simple Garden says, Dr. Bean Medical Lecture sent link to a Patreon message since link is too long for YouTube or Twitter. OK, I will check that out. One more question here, then I'm going to go to the Twitter. So Susan says, which autoimmune disease patients would be OK getting vaccines, Graves, MS, Lupus, Hashimoto's, Edison's, all of them? The vaccine itself. So I'm going to talk about autoantibodies in a second. On the Twitter side, I was kind of saving that question because it is an interesting and important discussion to do. This kind of a question can be actually lumped with that as well. But generally, if you don't have severe allergic reactions, then getting a vaccine, if you are autoimmune patient, does not really bother your immune system. Now, having said that, let's talk about autoimmunity. So today we are going to, Jenna, you're going to go? Too late? So let's look at this important question. The question here on the Twitter, could autoantibodies explain long haul syndrome? And there is a study here, which I have open here. This one, good study done. And this study, they are saying new onset IgG autoantibodies in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So please look at every word here, new onset IgG antibodies. So new antibodies, hospitalized patients, not long hauler. They're not talking about long hauler. They're talking about hospitalized. But still, the question is about the long hauler. And I want to talk about this mechanism. We have not talked about this before. And the study is saying, we developed three different protein arrays to measure hallmark IgG autoantibodies, autoantibodies, not antibodies, associated with connective tissue disease, anti-cytokine antibodies, and antiviral antibody response in 147 hospitalized patients. And their conclusion was that, yes, we concluded that SARS-CoV-2 causes development of new onset IgG autoantibodies in a significant proportion of hospitalized COVID-19 patients and are positively correlated with immune response. So let's look at what they're talking about here. <clears throat> here is what's happening. Why this is a new thing for all of us or at least not all of us, meaning in our discussions. The new concept is that our body treats our own self as antigen as well. Our body does not forgive anything. Our immune system, for our immune system, everything is foreign. So when the immune cells are formed, we have to teach them to ignore our own tissue and not attack it. In some people, they, the immune system does not learn to ignore every tissue and it starts attacking them. These are called autoimmune diseases. In some cases, after some infection or tissue damage, our immune system can go mad at our own tissue later on. It was not mad at our tissue before, but now it has become mad. And that is what I, I want to talk about. That is what that study is. We'll connect it with the possibility of long hauler as well. So let's see. So let's say here is a cell. And I am deliberately making it like this. And the cell has a cell membrane, of course. The cell membrane is actually a phospholipid bilayer. And what does that mean? What that means is it has a layer of lipids in it, fats in it. And then on the inner and outer side of this layer are phosphates, phosphates. Oh, 
on the inner side as well and the outer side as well phosphates are fine to work with water so they are okay with water while the lipids do not like water and because on the outer side we have phosphates and on the inner side of the membrane we have phosphates, water can be on the inside or outside without any issue and our cell can live in that water. And that's what happens. We have water inside and we have water outside. And this water is working fine with phosphates. However, things cannot cross this cell membrane because the central parts of the cell membrane are lipids and lipids would not allow things to just pass by. That is why zinc or other charged components cannot move from outside to inside the cell. Now, things that are inside the cell, for example, we have ribosomes inside the cell. We have a nucleus and nucleus has DNA. Then we have RNAs inside the cell. We have Golgi operatuses. We have uh, mitochondria, sorry, yes, mitochondrias. And we have endosomes and a number of other organelle. Our immune system cells, if I make a cell here, immune system cell, our immune system cell actually do not know our tissue from inside. And how can I give an example? Let's, let's look at that. This is an important concept. Many of you already know it. So my apologies if I'm taking some time but i think we should be on the same page imagine this is a cell and imagine i am an immune cell this is a regular cell so when i look at this cell i look at on only the outer side of it i am trained in my thymus for example if i'm a t cell and the bone marrow if i'm in a b cell to recognize my own tissue and ignore it from attacking i'm a soldier who has learned to ignore my own people. But if when I am born as a soldier, I would attack anyone, including my own people. That is how T and B cells work. But then we train them and we say, come on, guys, this tissue is our own. Now imagine if I'm that immune system, I have been trained to ignore this cell. But <clears throat> let's say a virus arrives, SARS-CoV-2 or bacteria or fungus that goes in the cell, breaks the cell open and the cell is now broken and it opens up. So when it is opened up, imagine now me as an immune cell look inside for the first time and I say, oh man, look at this. What is this? I've never seen this before. This is some foreign material. And here I'm looking at ribosomes and I'm looking at DNAs and I'm looking at RNAs and I'm saying, what the heck? I've never seen those things before. I better attack them. So all of a sudden, me as an immune system, is possible that I would start recognizing my own tissue as enemy because I am looking at the broken pieces of the tissue. So if I go here, um, I just realized that I am not sharing. So let me share. So if I go back here, imagine this cell got, got broken. So when the cell got broken, we have now the broken pieces of the cell. So this is the membrane of the cell. And let's say, a part of the membrane is intact. This is the cell. And then there is another piece that is broken here. Another piece is broken here. Some part is broken in here. There is part of the nucleus that is here and is present. Another piece of the nucleus has broken away and is outside. Some DNA is sticking out of the cell. Some RNA is sticking out. Some broken ribosomes are sitting there. Some mitochondria are out here. And so now the immune system cell that is sitting here, he has become really, really curious and saying, what the hell is that? And now I'm looking at, if I'm an immune system, I'm looking at phosphates for the first time in my life. Not really, I'm, I'm dramatizing and saying, oh man, I am going to not like these phosphates. I'm looking at the DNA of my own cell for the first time and I'm saying, oh, I hate this DNA. This is foreign. I'm going to attack it or RNA. So what I do is, I pick up some DNA of my own tissue cell. I eat it up, digest it. I'm a dendritic cell or macrophage. And I present it to the immune system. And I 
ask them to I prime them to start attacking it. Those immune cells that have now become primed never knew the inside of my cells before. Now they know it and they are going to start making antibodies against those cellular components and those antibodies are going to start coming in and start getting attached to the cells, healthy cells as well, and then start damaging them. These are the autoantibodies and autoantibodies can be formed after many kind of infections, not just SARS-CoV-2. Many infections with viruses and bacteria and fungi can result in autoantibody production, which then results in autoimmune diseases for a long time. And another possibility here, this is one possibility of production of autoantibodies. Another possibility is that here, let's say this is a cell. And let's say the cell surface has this pattern on it. This is the, imagine this is a ball and the surface of the ball has this pattern on it. I'm just making some pattern. Imagine now we have a pathogen that also has this pattern. And our immune system had learned to ignore this pattern in the past because this pattern is on our normal cells. So immune system had learned to ignore it. But here comes a virus or a bacteria that has its shape looking like this pattern. And that is making immune system mad. So immune system said, fine, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to eat you up. I'm going to digest you. And I'm going to learn and tell my immune system to attack any pattern like this. And now all of a sudden, this tissue that was not supposed to be attacked starts getting attacked because something from outside is looking like this pattern. This is called molecular mimicry, that something that came from outside is mimicking our tissue's pattern. For example, this happens in uh, rheumatoid, uh, sorry, rheumatic fever, that the pathogen that comes in, that pathogen, the strep, looks like our cardiac tissue valve uh, patterns. And our immune system start attacking our own heart, thinking this is the pathogen. So it is also possible that some pathogen comes in, let's say SARS-CoV-2, and it has some pattern on it that matches the pattern of our tissue. And then immune system, once triggered, start attacking our own tissue forever. And now we have another autoimmune disease. So autoimmune diseases can be con genetic, congenital, where our body just doesn't know not to be attacking the tissue. And then it can be triggered by some disease as well. Mostly viral infections can trigger autoimmune diseases by these mechanisms. By breaking our tissue, then our immune system picks up broken tissue and starts wondering what the hell is this, and then starts getting primed and triggered against it. And now we have an autoimmune disease. So with this backdrop, with this concept, now if we go back here, they are saying, we conclude that SARS-CoV-2 causes development of new onset IgG autoantibodies in a significant proportion of hospitalized patients. So now let's dissect this statement. A person who is hospitalized means they have a lot of tissue damage and that is why they are hospitalized because they have tissue damage, they have cytokine storm, they have low oxygen levels, they need a lot of help. That also means that their cells are getting broken down. That also means that their immune system is getting training to attack their own cells because immune system is experiencing. It is looking at the pieces of broken cell inside for the first time. And so, of course, immune system is going to make autoantibodies against the phospholipids which are these um, cell membrane components, or against the nuclei or the DNA. These are anti-nuclear antibodies. Or against the cytokine molecules that are developed, and these would be anti-cytokine antibodies. It is understandable. Normally, these autoantibodies will go away. 
the tissue will get repaired, these broken things will go away, and our antibodies will go away. In some cases, they will not. And yes, it is possible that the body would now start having that autoimmune response, and we will have the autoantibodies. Excuse me, let me open the door for Luffy. So um, to conclude this, to look at this question and then to look at the study and then to conclude it, the basic idea that can we have autoantibodies? Yes. Um, should they be in hospitalized patients? Yes, because their tissues are breaking down and our immune system would be attacking it. Should those autoantibodies remain forever? Ideally not. But there are infections after which people can develop autoimmune. For example, rheumatic fever is an example. That infection occurred once, and then for the whole life, the patient has to take penicillin because there is a there is a destruction of the heart tissue, and there is a possible secondary infections that are going to happen for the whole life. So there are some cases where this can happen for a long time. Is SARS-CoV in that area yet? We do not have enough data. So hopefully, these folks who did this research can continue to follow people for a longer time to say, did these folks continue to have these or did their autoantibody production stop after some time when the tissues got repaired? So this is the basic concept, very important question. Now, does it relate to long haulers? Possible. It is possible that their immune system has become dysregulated. This is a type of dysregulation as well. And now the virus has done hit and run, but immune system is just continuing to go after our tissues. So for that, once again, a long hauler should get their anti-nuclear antibodies. They should look at anti-cytokine antibodies, anti-phospholipid antibodies, and so on. So uh, these antibodies can be checked too. And, and there is another question here, which is related to this. So let me just look at that question as well. Um, that question was, lots of questions here. Here, Puya Dhagni Mubarki says, anti-phospholipid antibodies in COVID. Yes, so that is also possible because this part is the phospholipid part and then anti-phospholipid antibodies can be produced. And I have another study here. Um, works, I mean. Here. So if you look at this one, antiphospholipid antibody, this is not about COVID. This is generally that can we have antiphospholipid antibodies? Yes. And now antiphospholipid antibodies are important because they are against the phospholipid component of the cell membranes. That causes a big important thing that happens is that, let's say this is a blood vessel. And antibodies are now circulating in the blood vessels and in the serum and outside in the tissue. Now, these antibodies are antiphospholipid. So what they will do is the blood vessels, endothelial cells, the inner lining of the blood vessel, they all have the phospholipids as well because the phospholipids make the cells membranes, or all cells membranes. So these antibodies connect there and attack the endothelial cell. That causes endothelial cell damage and that causes clotting. So the clotting or hypercoagulability, hypercoagulability could be because of the antiphospholipid antibodies. Now that could be because of COVID and that can, could be separately as well. So this one here uh, with the NIH, this is not about COVID, but just generally what is antiphospholipid antibodies and what is the outcome? Outcome normally is bleeding disorders and clotting disorders. And then, um, here, this is one more study. This is COVID-19 antiphospholipid antibodies and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, a possible association. The catastrophic syndrome is where antiphospholipid antibodies are so abundant that they attack the blood vessels so much that they cause so much thrombosis and coagulation that the person can die. And we see that in cytokine storm. So is that possible? Yes, there is a possibility there. 
So I'm going to leave the Twitter side till this point, although I have uh, uh, liked a bunch of more things as well. But we are at 722. So I'm going to look here on the live side, and we'll continue with Twitter uh, maybe on Monday. So how are you doing? Was I just, just talking by myself? Or so. <clears throat> Um, Gold Country says vitamin D3 and absolutely correct. Vitamin D3 would balance out the immune system to kind of help with all of these issues. Uh, M. St. Clair says that. Uh, a trial site news is saying that there's a company in Belgium developing a one dose lifetime immunity COVID vaccine that is based on the yellow fever vaccine in use now for many decades. I'd fly to Europe for that. Interesting. I would love to see what they are doing. Anthony is saying that I'm investigating my age from old need to test with Lyme too. Absolutely. Uh, have you talked with Dr. Dennis as well? Dr. St Sorry, Dennis, I'm saying Dr. Stephen Phillips. OK, so it seems like we don't have many questions here. So if I can then look at some more Twitter question. John C says, will a person taking ivermectin prophylactically who is exposed to SARS-CoV-2 from an immune system reaction to it, exposed to form an immune system reaction to it that results in lasting immunity? It seems the answer would be yes, but maybe not. John, so I have talked about it. I want to do this one topic as a separate video as well because people ask this very often. Ivermectin will not affect your infection immune system readiness based on infection or vaccine because ivermectin does not interfere with the immune system presentation and immune system's readiness. Ivermectin reduces the viral load. Ivermectin helps reduce some inflammation as well, but it does not interfere with immune system's readiness. <laughs> Phil Lee says, your master is calling. Absolutely. He, he has to go to the next room every day at this time. So he comes in and starts speaking aloud, and he knows that his... <laughs> His servant would appear and open the door for him. <laughs> Al says Luffy has been activated. Yes. <laughs> Carrie says Luffy's brain is full. Okay, so uh, tell me, um, should we stop here and then continue on Monday? Juliet says, I've had tetanus and still have late state Lyme. I would love to hear back from Dr. Stephen Phillips. You're both so. Friend. Yeah, I think he would uh, he would be good to talk with. Jody says, question, is the treatment for all this steroids? Um, two possible treatments. If the reason for long hauling is that the virus is hiding in the body, then treatment is going to be continuous suppression of the symptom if we cannot get it out. Remember, there can be carrier states with hepatitis, which we cannot do anything about, and it would stay with us for, forever. So in those cases, all we can do is suppress the symptoms. And most importantly, to suppress the symptoms, steroids are used, but in low therapy. And we don't want to use steroid for so long. So then ivermectin-like things or hydroxychloroquine-like things will be useful. If it is the immune system dysregulated, then again, for example, autoantibodies type situation, 
then once again, we'll have to calm down the immune system forever. And that would mean uh, some low dose therapy like lironlimab or steroids. Steroids are to be avoided. So some other thing that can specifically target those cells that are releasing cytokines. Third possibility is that immune system is actually healthy, but forgot to uh, shut down itself after the infection. In that case, you give a pulse of the steroid and then maybe another pulse and the person recovers. All of my patients have recovered with the pulses of steroid and none of them had to go on a chronic state. But my patients also had a difference from others and that is that from the very first day I attack with very aggressive treatments. So my hope is one, to prevent them from ending up in hospital and second, to prevent them from becoming long haulers. So maybe my treatment has been an exception in the main, mainstream treatment. If a person ends up becoming a long hauler, these are the couple of things that may be doable. Wayne says 10,000 to 20,000 uh, daily. So I take it 10,000 to 20,000. I have been taking it since mine was low. But uh, of course, you have to look at your levels and then decide if it is still needed or not. Anthony says, it, I think COVID may be persistent too, but only one. Absolutely. Rosie says, hit the like button. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I have been taking uh, 20,000. Nowadays, I have started skipping because I think I've been taking for a very long time. The right thing to do is to go get the vitamin D levels and then based on that, decide to reduce it or not. <laughs> Jim Maddox says dogs are masters and cats are servants. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, William says, Dr. Bean, how much vitamin D do you take and when your uh, last blood test? My last blood test was after I started taking 10,000 to 20,000 daily, and that had brought the vitamin D level up to 39. After that, I have not gotten my test again, but I had been taking 20,000 daily. Now for about a month, I have started skipping it and I take it every second or third day. But the right thing to do is for me to go back and get the test done. Maybe uh, Avox coffee bean has to shame me into going and getting the test done again. Last time he had said, he said, should I send you the fee to get your test done? And I, I went and got the test done. Roller Girl says, why does Luffy like that room? Luffy likes to be around people. So more than the room, uh, he likes to be around people. Now, when he comes in here, that room is usually closed. And he loves it because he's very curious about it. And so he... That is like him going to park. He has to go to that room once because we keep it closed and it's his curiosity. Rosie says, I found your channel earlier today. Great advice with vitamin D, K2 and calcium. Thank you very much. Um, so let's do this. If you are OK, I will stop here today. And we have a bunch of uh, um, Twitter questions as well. Jefferson says, I have a question. Jefferson, please let me know what is your question. Then we can stop here and continue on Monday. Seventh Day says, love how you simplify complex. Thanks. You are very welcome. My pleasure. Nina says, I'm OK, Doc. So thank you very much. So Nina, uh, can you get the approval to use this? Um, or maybe even made once more without the ivermectin man or and maybe a ivermectin woman as well, if they're OK or we can pay for it. Uh, Ali G says, uh, can I have vaccination while on chemotherapy, methotrexate? Yes, yeah, so uh, immunosuppression is a possibility and taking vaccine is important. So let me stop sharing so I can. Uh, 
You are correct. So William MK7. So vitamin K2 MK7 is good to take with vitamin D. Super Bowl is tomorrow. So happy Super Bowl. <laughs> Let's see what Tom Brady does in the other from the other team now. Absolutely. So please let me know what is the next topic. The things that I have taken down, Ebola, pregnancy and COVID, Sinopharm, uh, Biva, C, Zumab, uh, Medicago, then Regeneron and Bam, Lenivimab in light of FDA approvals, uh, that how can a doctor be informed that, hey, these are approved drugs and they are OK to use them and so on. So I have a bunch of uh, things here. Wayne says, go because I'm <laughs> betting 1,000 in the coin toss. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, question, do you suggest anticoagulant, even aspirin with ivermectin? That depends upon the age. If somebody is at an age, for example, 50, 60, 70-ish, where they need to have anticoagulants, then yes. But if they are healthy and their age is low, then no. <laughs> Roller Girl says, may the best team win. Yes. Juliet says, you're precious. Thank you very much. So uh, I would cite my mandatory compulsory things. And that is, uh, please like, subscribe, and share. And then in the description, there are three links. One link is if you would like to become my patron. And the second link is if you would like to buy me a coffee. Third link is if you just would like to support the work that you're seeing. If you like this work, uh, then that'll be great. So I have these three links. And of course, please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, tomorrow, I'll have an off. So thank you very much, Jan. I would take a day off. Um, Aliji says, should I stop methotrexate for the time being to take vaccination? That is a very, very important question to discuss with your doctor. If I have a patient, I will not stop them from methotrexate because um, it depends upon what is their cancer's progression. And so I would not like the cancer's progression to be more at risk. Debbie, Debbie had a comment here, which I just saw. Nancy says, good night, Dr. Meena. Good night. Absolutely. Good night. Have fun. Um, please, everyone, enjoy. Have a great uh, Sunday, enjoy, relax, and relaxation is actually very, very important. Uh, CC says, we watched Superdog Bean. Thank you very much. John, love, love back to you as well. Okay, cool. So we are near the end of our discussion. Phil Lee says, I have not been told to stop my methotrexate and was advanced in the list with wax due to it. Absolutely. So ideally, methotrexate should continue and uh, vaccination should be given as well. Um, I just saw Margaret. So Margaret, we were missing you uh, for and talking about you. I just saw a message from you as well. Just scrolled up. Uh, where, where did it go? <laughs> it, it scrolled up. Uh, Mr. Redacted says, Dr. Sayed, please compare the risk and potential toxicity from the COVID vaccine adjuvants like a the saponin in the Novavax vaccine might be good show topic. OK, so let me take a note. Vaccine adjuvant saponin. Do you know the fun thing that we talked about the ADE discussion yesterday? In that discussion, they had said that those vaccines that have adjuvants do not have ADE and those that do not have adjuvants have ADE. So that, that was just interesting. Here I see Margaret now. Margaret, how are you doing? Thank you very much. Good night to everyone. And so one last time and then good night. So please like, subscribe, and share. Please, uh, if you would like to support this work, there are links for becoming a patron, to buying me a coffee, or to support me. So thank you very much. Uh, there is a discussion with Debbie Boss. Um, so Romana says, Debbie Boss, a puzzling thing for me was that the case studies I've read were healthy patients with robust immune system and no restriction of sensory infection childhood. 
So I get an immunocompromised patients. Okay, so there's a side discussion. All right. Good night, everyone. So here is a question. William says, besides the medication and supplements already discussed, are there any new ones that is in on your radar that hasn't been discussed? Yes, yeah, so there are a number of things that are interesting. For example, um, the uh, what was that? We've talked about BAM learning remap. We haven't talked about fluvoxamine. I want to talk about that. And then there are a couple of more such drugs that have been thought to be good uh, for recovery and for long hauling. So I'm going to look for them and talk about them. And there is a super chat here as well. So Laura has a super chat. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, yes, cold kitchen is another that. And let me actually write it down. I was thinking about this. Yes, that too. Cool. So per perfect. Thank you very much. Good night. And I'll see you on Monday. Tomorrow is my off. And we will watch Super, Super Bowl. Bye-bye.